Shalom, welcome to our daily class on Rabbi Nachman and Patreon. We're holding in Torah Nun Vav in the long, well, it seems like all the paragraphs are long. No, this is the third paragraph. But, you know, it's not really about how long it is, it's how it enters us and how it changes things. And we are holding in the last quarter of the paragraph, and the first word on the line is Bechinat Midot. We've been talking about Midot, the measures of the Torah, the measures of life force, and how these things are demarcated, and how they can be sources of great power and destruction, according to each person. And we begin, the Rebbe starts, Ki yesh pasukim He gives us categories that we're all familiar with in the Torah, and for that matter, most books. Most books contain measures. What are the measures of a book? Letters, words, pasukim, verses, sentences, Parshiot, which normally we could we would call chapters, and Sidarim are collections of chapters, which would probably be in the English lexicon a, a, a section of a book, if you will, or an act in a play, because an act is a collection of scenes, etc., and these are all midot. So the Torah is taking the will of God and spreading it over these measures. Shehem nikbal achiut amida, because these measures give us boundaries to the life force of each measure. Okay, so you see, a word contains a certain amount of power. A letter contains, contains a certain amount of power also. A sentence contains a little more. A paragraph a little more. A chapter more. And, well, ultimately, five books of Moses you know, holds a lot of power. Now you might think, well, but it's just a word, words and letters on a page that we read. And then it's translated into the human mind. But you see that it's not that simple because the human mind is a word processor. And the food of the mind are words and ideas. And a person's ideas are a measure of his power. Now there's many ways to measure power. How much weight you can lift, how fast you can run, how long you can hold your breath how long you can talk. There's many ways of measuring human power. The Torah measures a little differently. The Torah measures life force according to the soul of a person. So the soul of a person can be measured in how long he's lived, how much desire he has for life, how much memory a person has, how much a person can talk. I'm talking about real talking, not just chattering. A person's ability to think long and deeply, concentrate. These are all measures of life force. Now you have also sleep itself. How much sleep do you need? The more sleep, well, the less force you have in your soul, and the less sleep you need, well, the more force. Now, we're not talking about, you know, lives that are driven by caffeine and, <laughs> and other substances. And then, of course, dreams themselves are measures of our connection to the higher soul. And how much you dream, how often you dream, how long are your dreams, how much content is in the dream, all of that teaches us about life force connection to the upper soul. 
And Reb Nachman tells us also Chidushe Torah, that Chidushe Torah have a length and a, and a, and a depth and a, and a distance and a power. That each have a measure. And all of them create boundaries to the, to the infinite life force that fills this entire universe. Therefore, through the Torah, which is the longest name of God, which is this idea of measures, we can get, receive the life force through the Torah. Because through Torah, we're actually calling on life. The life that has no death. And we draw the life force into these measures called letters, words, sentences, etc. You know, if someone says, Oh, I love you. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it has much life force behind that love, right? It's so, Ah, oh, I, I love you. Sounds like they have a little more life force. You hear it in the words. But that, those words are measures we're being told in the Torah of life force. Now, Shehem Bichinat Yamim, and they're, one of the measures of the Torah are days. The days of your life, the days of a week, the days of a month, the days of a year, etc. These are also measures, not just of time, but of life force. umidat yamai mahi. So King David said, well, the measures of my life, what are they? King David's looking back and saying, how do I measure my life? How, how, you know, it's, think about it. How do you measure your life? By how much money you made? How many houses you have? <laughs> it's a pretty, you know, artificial measure compared to determining what you've actually given to the world. The King David said, Midat Yamai Mahi, what are the measures of my life? Ayinu Bara Torah Shi Bikinat Ma. So the Rebbe makes a change in of inflection in the verse. And by changing that inflection, he changes the meaning of the words. He says, Midat Yamai Ma He. It's what? The measures of my life are the Ma. The question. Have you thought of measuring your life in questions? The Baal Shem Tov taught that we are all given a certain number of words. You can measure your life in the number of words you speak. But here King David, Rabbi Nachman is playing on King David's words to say, Ma, he. That's the Midat Yamai, Ma, he. What is the measure of my life? The Ma. How much questions I've asked. Like we ask on the Leil Seder, the night of Passover, the four questions. What are the what has changed on this night? What are these statutes and judgments that you've given us? Well, the measures, the statutes and judgments are the midot. God is timeless, so he doesn't measure himself by time. But God says, you can measure me by my judgments, my statutes, my laws. By calling out the Torah, we draw this life force of his measurements into the days and the measures. Because without those laws and statutes and mental destructures, we would not be able to draw his life force into the measures. It's just like if you have a very strong voice but have no words. You're like, you know, a baby crying out. He has no words. He just, ah, just cries, screams, whatever it is. There's no measure to it. There's no end, usually, until you have to leave the room or, you know, take a, an aspirin. But really, you see, the idea is so the life force needs something to go in, into letters and words and sentences and ideas. 
And then it gets pl a place for God to appear in your mind. And so when you read the Torah out loud, this is the key. The real key is saying the words out loud. And you say, well, what if I don't know Hebrew? Well, it's a good time to practice. And you can learn it in, in transliteration in English word letters. Now, but without those mishpatim, without those laws and statutes and words and etc., it was be impossible to receive because of the ribui or too much light. Too much light is one of the biggest problems if you're God, because He has all the light. His, his work has always been to constrict that light into vessels that man can use, man can receive from. And this is a, a command, and karabu, and call it all the days of, your, of his life. Calling out the words of the Torah all the days of his life. This is uh, attributed to, to King David as well. And it's also, in other forms, has been attributed to Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, and in the laws. We're commanded to call out the words of Torah all the days of our lives. And again, through this calling out, we take the life force of your soul. It comes out through your throat, into your mouth, out your mouth, and into the world. You're moving life force from inner to outer. But you're doing it in a very specific, precise way called the days and the measures of the Torah. Therefore, specifically, we need to call out in the Torah with our mouth. The mouth. So when you want to call someone by their name, you have to use your mouth. You can't call them with your elbow. You know, you call them with your mouth. So the mouth is the tool of the expression of the life force. And that's why you get tired when you talk a lot. And that's why you don't want to answer people sometimes because you're tired. Or that's maybe because, uh, you know, there's just too many words in the world. Sometimes we need silence. We've all experienced that, I'm sure. It's impossible to call a person in his name through thought. I cannot call you through thought. You might get to say, well, if you're telepathic, you can. And there is truth to that statement, but he's not talking about that level. He's talking here in this world. Because it's impossible to call out to God through your thought alone. In other words, people have asked, can I just pray in my mind without saying the words? You know, and God reads thoughts, and God knows in your mind. And if you're talking to God in your mind, it's not like it's nothing. But he says it's impossible to call to God truly unless you're saying the words out loud. And it's not through only thought. I'm praying to God. Well, I'm not actually praying. I'm thinking to God. And listen, there's a lot worse things <laughs> that we can think about. But it's still not the same as calling out the words because there... You're transferring the life force from the highest place in your soul to the lowest. Speech. Physical reality. V'zeshamru Chazal are taught in Eruvin, Ki chayim hem lemotzehem. They are life to those who call her. Or call them. You call it the words of Torah, you're calling to yourself life. It's almost like you create a vacuum in yourself to draw more life by giving over your life in Torah. Through the mouth, they're expressed. Because this gives a person life. Through learning Torah, and this draws 
long days. Now we've learned about this concept elsewhere in Lukuti Moran that long days, it's not just that, oh, what a long day, I'm so tired. <laughs> that happens. No, the long days are days where you feel like you've done so much you can't even remember everything you've done. Where you get so much done because it just you're in the, well, they call it the zone. You're in the flow. You're in the groove. Whatever you call it, you know what it is when you've been there. And it's that power that just makes you accomplish so much in so little time. We've got some chickens here that want to go in the house. Guys, you belong outside. <laughs> but they have life force too. You ever look at an animal? They're, they have life force just like we do. It's just on a different level of software, a different level of commands, a different level of functions, a different level of modes. But they have the life force. Just like that little chicken over there. I, <laughs> you have to forgive me. They're, they're kind of sweet, you know. And as it is written, that wisdom itself gives life to the one who acquires it. Because your intellect is the essential part of your power or life force. Now, sechel is a big word for it's Jews usually translated as intelligence, but we know how big intelligence is many, many, many categories of intelligence. But that's where the life force is coming from. The idea dot through this dot or knowledge of, and of things and intelligence of using knowledge, then through, through true das, knowledge and intellect, you're able to draw somebody closer and correct them and warn them if it's necessary, which seems to be kind of necessary. Uh, day in and day out in life. So this this piece here, it's something you have to review. And go, I remember learning it and learning it because I wanted to get what is this, this differentiation of life force? It's, it's appearing in so many places. One time I remember I was out on a dirt road and there was just a dirt road and I was davening, praying to Hashem. And I looked down and I saw one blade of grass like sticking its tiny head above the dirt in the road. So what is this blade of grass doing out here growing in the middle of a road? But it suddenly hit me, that piece of grass is alive. And it has life force. It desires to get up in the morning and do what a blade of grass has to do. That's life force. And so too for each and every one of us on every level of existence. So I think we are... going to do one more paragraph. It's Thursday. Tomorrow we'll do our Arab Shabbat class and we're going to be posting soon uh, a whole series, a little video series on, on Kever Root and Yishai in Hebron. I was there today filming. So, you know, there's things coming along and we're told here an idea that we had earlier in the Torah that there's a revelation, a revealed kingship and a hidden kingship. Well, he tells us here there are two levels of hastarot, hiddenness. The two levels of hiddenness. The first level is when God is hidden with one level of hiddenness. In other words, I look around this beautiful place and I don't see God himself. I see a beautiful place. I have faith and I believe and I know that he's there behind this uh, you know, view in the hills of uh, Judea. That's, but that's still a level of hiddenness. And it is difficult to find him in this place. Nevertheless, when God is hidden in one level of hiddenness, it is possible to find him. Because he knows God is hidden. Mimenu. It's, it, you know, you can find something, it's easier to find something when you know that it's hidden from you. When God is hidden in a hiddenness, inside another level of hiddenness, that even the hiddenness is hidden from you, then, well, then we're in trouble. Because I don't even see that God's hidden. 
דיינו שאינו יודע כלל שרב שמעון פרק נסתר ממנו. There are billions of people that walk around, they don't know that, God, that God's hidden from them. They don't even think about it. That's a hiding within hiding. Azai yifshah klal lipsoto me'achar Hashem yodeh klal me'ashem yiparah Because the person doesn't know anything about God, so he's not going to know that he's hidden from him. Vzeh b'chinat anuchi astir astir et panai And this is what it says, uh, God told Moses in Devarim in the Tochacha, I will hide uh, myself in a double language, da'inu ha'shastir ha'astorah, that I will then hide the fact that I'm hidden. And that's really hidden. Because then you don't even know. Shelo yadu klal she'ashem yibarak nistar. And he repeats the idea, we don't know that he's hidden, v'azai b'vada'in yuchol imtso uto yibarak, and then he certainly, certainly can't find him. Me'achar she'enu yodea klal she'tzarik levakesh oto yibarak. Because he doesn't even know that you have to ask for him. You know, it, it reminds me, you know, <laughs> going into a lunchroom at a school, and you don't see the food. You walk in, it happens, right? I remember it happening in yeshiva. You don't see the food, and you're like, well, what do I do? Sit down and wait for the waiters to bring me my, the, my food? Uh, you know, sounds a little bit entitled. But you don't know. That the, you know there's no food, so it's hidden from you. But you at least know that it's hidden. Another per- person walk in, there's no food here. What am I doing here? This is not the lunch room. I'm in the wrong room. And so and then comes along and says, no, 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 you have to ask someone for your food. Until you know the fact that you have to ask, it's in a double hiddenness. Once you know that you have to ask, you know, oh, it's hidden, but I know it's there. I just got to go over and knock on the door or on the window and say, we're here for lunch. Okay, a person doesn't even know that God is hidden from him. Because the hiddenness is hidden. So that is, that works on both extremes of the continuum of knowing God. There are those people who don't know a word. They don't know that there's a God. They don't know that there's one God. They've never heard about the Jewish people. They've never heard the story. Nothing. They're really in the deep level of hiddenness. But then there's another level of hiddenness where they don't, they know that God is hidden, but they're not asking, okay, there's a God, but I'm not, you know, God will do his job. I'll do mine. Everybody's fine. That's one level. Then there's a third level. There's a level of people who think that they're so close to God, Hashem Ishmur, God protect us. They think they're so close to God that he's like their bosom buddy. He's right there with them all the time. Now, that sounds great. Why wouldn't you want to think that? Well, there's a problem because we understand that we're on an infinite highway of steps and journeys of getting closer to God, and I should never think that, you know, God's in my back pocket, that he's just so close to me, I can just, you know, do what I want and know that God's there. And in fact, I can even not keep the Torah and it's fine with God. There are people that believe that too. Now, there is an idea of not keeping the Torah in order to keep it for later, uh, you know, saving a life on Shabbat, so even though you break Shabbat, which is a serious thing, there is a level where person is, of course, we break Shabbat to save lives so the person can keep many more Shabbatot. That's the language of the rabbis. But still, there's this exaggeration of a person's spiritual ego that also will hide the fact that God is hidden. And I've seen such people, and they make mistakes in their interpretations of their reality. And it usually comes crashing down in a sad way later on. Might be a year, might be two years, could be five years, could be two weeks. Depends on the person. But still, I think this is a very valuable un- understanding and a good way to understand both God's relationship to us and us ours to Him, and to remember that what we think about it is not important as much as what we do. And I want to 
learn more, pray more, and do more good deeds. And the key word there is just more. Always trying to increase, always trying to, to sanctify and to refine the path, refine the tools of perception, refine the measures, like he's talking about here, those measures that hold the life force. And when we get those measures down, and you just go with them with ease and grace, then your life takes on a new quality. And you'll see that you're not alone, God willing. We'll see you again on our daily class on Patreon and look for you on all the other outlets as well. Have a great day.